I'm going to remember that, Bob, not to worry about my wattage. <laughs> I love that we're talking about light in chapel this year. Light is about reflection, about transformation. Light looks different depending on what angle or what time of day or night you're looking at it. And so, as I reflect on the idea of light, I think about the many ways I understood it throughout my life. As a small child, I was taught a song that, to my young ears, sounded something like this. This little light of mine that I should let shine without hiding it under my bushel, cause the devil might blow it out. Wow, taking care of my little light was a huge responsibility. Light also meant comfort, as one of my parents would turn on a nightlight when I was afraid of the dark. As a young girl, I remember hiding in a dark closet with a cookie that I was told not to eat, fearing I would be found out, exposed by the light. In high school, the reality of light was powerful when I went caving for the first time. Utter darkness until someone lit a match, bringing illumination and awe. Again in high school, and even now, blinded by the light, the song by Manfred Mann's Earth Band plays in the back of my mind every time I hear a sermon preached about Lazarus being called out of his tomb after being dead for four days. And now I meditate on Jesus, the light of the world, and of being called out of darkness into his marvelous light in 1 Peter chapter 2. Light is so full. Before moving to New England, our family lived on the outskirts of one of the toughest neighborhoods in the city of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Just a few blocks from our home, there were drive-by shootings occurring at an alarming rate. Our tiny church, smack in the middle of the madness, strived to be a true light in the community. We were a quirky little, little culturally and racially mixed congregation with few resources, but determined to live for Jesus in the midst of decay. This decay was widespread, social, spiritual, emotional, physical. Our church was trying to bring healing and wholeness through the gospel of Jesus Christ to this neighborhood, and were in the process blessed by the wonderful people who lived there. One Easter morning, our family got up very early to sneak over to the church to decorate it for our friends so that it would be nice and festive when everyone arrived for Easter service. Now, I use decorate loosely here. We were a family of five, two adults who were not artistic, and three children, ages six, four, and two. We were armed and dangerous with fists full of colored chalk we were determined to spruce things up a bit. My husband, John, and I got busy writing things, writing on the church sidewalk things like, Hallelujah, Christ is risen, and Jesus Christ is risen today, and our Savior lives. The children delighted in scribbling in a variety of hues, drawing what they claimed were Easter eggs, rainbows, sunrises, and such. It was one big colorful mess, up and down the sidewalk in front of the church, up the crumbling concrete steps, and out onto the street. When we were satisfied that we had done enough, we walked back to our car to go home and get into our Easter finery, my four-year-old daughter and I straggling behind a bit. As we walked by one of the many vacant lots full of rubble and debris that typ typified this neighborhood, we spotted a sight that made us stop and stare in amazement and awe. One tiny flower, a purple crocus, was pushing its way up through a sea of rocks and garbage. And I cried. This solitary, fragile flower, standing alone in a hostile, concrete world, what must it have felt like to be born? What strength did it have to withstand that journey? Was it worth the pain? How did it get there? Mommy, why are you crying? My daughter asked with little girl sincerity. Because, I said, that is the most beautiful thing I have ever seen in my life. 
such hope, a sign of redemption in the brokenness that was all around us, life amidst despair. I couldn't wait to show our friends as they arrived at church. We all rejoiced at this Easter flower. Many years later, it's still a poignant memory. I can't express my gratitude to God, to God that day for the glimpse of beauty that he gave us. So, you might ask, what does this story have to do with light? A few weeks ago, I was thinking about what to speak about today, and I remembered that Easter morning in Pittsburgh. But I thought to myself, that's not really about light. That's more of a beauty for ashes kind of illustration. But the image of that little flower persisted, and I started to reflect, and I wrote this poem. And I have to say, I don't write poetry, so this was something special. It's called Flower in Rubble. I feel that struggle, wanting to remain in the darkness, pulled through rocks, pain. Every move movement bruises, scrapes, straining toward what? Drawn into the light, not my will, but thine. Glorious light, it is not my work. I am coaxed, yea, pulled into that blinding brightness by my loving Savior, rescued to be beautiful, consider the lilies. So, let's consider that flower. I want you to all put on your Bill Nye the Science Guy hats and think about this. And by the way, if there are any talented science students out there, and more horrifying to me, any science professors, I am asking you to be kind and full of grace. I'm quite limited in my understanding of botany, but I'm trying to make a point here. Question. Does a flower have anything to do with its own growth? Answer, I don't think so. It can't help it. It is created to grow in response to light. I looked up the word phototropic, and it is defined this way, growing toward or away from the light. Phototropism, which looks like phototropism, but the lady on dictionary.com that has the voice keeps telling me it's phototropism. So, whatever. <laughs> Is the growth and response to a light stimulus. Positive phototropism is growth toward a light source. I think it's safe to say, I hope, that a crocus is positively phototropic. God made it that way. Its growth is dependent on its response to the light. No light, no growth, no life. You see, I am like that flower, and so are you. Oh, how I long to be spared the hurt and pain that accompanies growth. I so often choose to remain in the dark, if only to protect myself from the pain that comes with exposure. Yet, when we belong to Christ, we are drawn to the light. This process is not without pain. We stumble and fall in the dark, get bruised and broken, but we are drawn to the light, and Jesus is that light. My growth, your growth, is dependent on our light source for life. No Jesus, no light, no life.